Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Liturgia YouTube channel uh, and today uh, we are back with the Old Believer series. I'm not sure which episode this is uh, but I think that's not relevant because I think we're going to try to get away from the numbers and instead focus on themes so that you can see what it's about in the title. Today I'm joined by, by Justin. How are you Justin? Doing well Philip and yourself? I'm good, I'm good, thank God. And uh, Please go on. So, so as we get ready to record, uh, for all of our listeners who are on the new calendar, getting ready to celebrate the Feast of the Nativity, uh, Merry Christmas to you and to our listeners who are on the old calendar, um, preparing to celebrate celebrate um, St. Spiridon, or here in America, St. Herman of Alaska, um, happy feast day to you as well. Yes, happy feast day. Christ is born. Glorify him. And I pray that one day we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to celebrate at the same date, but that's not what this what this <laughs> show is about today, <laughs> I think. Uh, so today we actually have quite a special episode for you uh, because it's about a very central figure in the whole old believerism or old believer history. And, and it's the Archpriest Avakum. Did I pronounce that right, Justin? Avakum, I think Avakum. we were. Yeah, we, we were we were reprimanded by by an old believer priest that we pronounced it wrong the last time. So if if he's listening, forgive us if we botched it again. I mean, we're doing our best. Um, so uh, today we'll thought we'll speak to you about Archbishop Avakum, um, and I will just briefly start by presenting him to you because I, I think that most people know maybe the name but no, no, do not know the story behind it. And then Justin will take over and then we'll have a discussion because there's actually quite a lot to discuss about him, especially uh, the view on him today. Uh, but let me just quickly start by an introduction. Um, so in Russian, it's usually Protopop Avakum, which is archpriest. Uh, his name was Avakum Petrov and he was born uh, in 1620, in what is today present day Nizhny Novgorod. We actually know quite little about his childhood and early life. Uh, the, the main thing we know is that his father was a priest and that Avakum grew up in what we would consider a typical pious Russian priest family. Um, and please, Justin, if you if you have something to add in some point, just drop in because I, I, I might have forgotten something. Yeah. I, so, I have no problem interrupting you. Yeah, I know that's, that's standard. That's the way it goes. Uh, so Avakum became a priest very early, actually. He became a, a priest at, at the age of 23 um, in a small, in a small uh, village parish where he served for eight years before he was elevated to the rank of archpriest or protopop, as you would say in, in the old Russian tradition. Um, so Avakum was a member of a group within the church uh, that consisted of clergy uh, wanting some sort of liturgical rebirth to take place which generally meant that what they wanted was uh, to get rid of all the liturgical abuses that, have, that had gotten into the Russian practices and they wanted to somehow return to the old pious Russian ways, the, the, you know, the practices of St. Sergei of Radonezh, for example. Uh, now, Avakum's participation in this group brought him to Moscow in the early 19, uh, 1650s, so he was around 30. Um, it is there where he met the future patriarch Nikon, which we already have spoken about. We did an episode about Nikon. And, uh, and so both Nikon and Avakum were part of this, of this group within the church wanting a liturgical rebirth, so to speak, to take place. Uh, it is also not a surprise that Avakum actually supported Nikon to be the patriarch. Uh, Nikon, however, as we all know, when he became patriarch, initiated the reforms, which went far and beyond uh, anything that Avakum ever wanted or could imagine. And interestingly enough, um, Avakum would actually later write that his support of Nikon to be patriarch was the biggest mistake of his life, which is very interesting. Now, Avakum uh, opposed the reforms uh, because he believed that the Greeks of Constantinople, um, on who we have to be honest, they were based on, uh, he believed that they had lost their orthodoxy, and especially so after falling into Ottoman hands and after the failed Union attempts with Rome. We remember here the, the Union of Florence, failed, the failed Union of Florence. And there, that's why he actually considered the Greeks to be heretical, or at least some of their practices to be heretical. Um, he, he actually believed completely and wholeheartedly that total and complete orthodoxy was to be found in the Russian church as it was delivered to them 
uh, by Saints Kirill, Methodius, and other missionaries of that age. Uh, he also saw the Council of Stoglaf in 1551. We also did an episode of this about this council. He saw this council as the pinnacle of expressing Russia's orthodoxy. Uh, and therefore, he simply saw Nikon's reforms as corrupting the church with heresy. And he also associated the whole process of the reforms somehow to the Antichrist, to the spirit of the Antichrist. After the removal of Nikon uh, as patriarch, there seemed to, be, uh, seemed to have been hope for Avakum and some other opponents as they were invited to Moscow by the Tsar. And there was, it seems that there was a genuine attempt to resolve the issues. However, Avakum didn't agree to any compromise at all, and he was quickly back into exile, which we, which, which he had been for many years. Uh, while Avakum was highly critical of Nikon himself and other reformers, he actually kept much more positive mindset towards the Tsar, um, which is very interesting. Um, it is actually known that Avakum prayed for the Tsar up until his death, and in a letter from Avakum to the Tsar, he wished him all the best. And he also saw him as being sent by God himself. So it's clear that Avakum blamed Nikon for the reforms and not the Tsar, whom he saw as a God-appointed ruler. It is safe to claim that if not for his extreme and zealot-like opposition to the reforms, Avakum would have mostly been unknown to history today. Uh, instead, because of his opposition, he is seen as the very symbol of the opposition of these reforms. And, and he's, of course, venerated as a martyr saint among the old believers. Avakum, during this whole process of the reforms and exile, he wrote his own uh, biography, uh, which is actually considered a Russian literary classic up until today, and one of the first, if not the first, works written in what we would call modern Russian instead of the old church language. Um, in his biography, Avakum recount, recounts the, the different hardships that he had to endure for his opposition towards the reforms, and he paints an overall picture as to why the reforms themselves were heretical in his opinion. It is important to note that Avakum is not always considered a saint by the old believers for his way of life, even if it was pious, or, for, or especially so for his writings. Uh, many of his writings are controversial even among unbelievers, and, and and even Avakum often uses very harsh and vulgar language towards the reformers and, 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 and his opponents, not only calling them heretics, but for example, Avakum called the Pope of Rome, quote, whore of Rome, end quote, and then compared him to Nikon, claiming Nikon was the same. Rather, it is therefore important to, to point out that he's venerated as a martyr because he died for Christ. That's how the old believers see it. Uh, the view on Avakum as martyr is... Uh, is also not uncommon among some faithful of the canonical Russian Orthodox Church today. Um, we might call them Edino Vierce or old ritualists, uh, who, who also in some extent, to some extent recognize that he did die for the old Russian practices. He is however not officially uh, canonized or venerated a saint. I think he's more looked upon as, as someone that they respect for his suffering uh, for the old right, so to speak. So that was a brief, brief introduction. And I'll, I'll give it now over to Justin for his thoughts, for his additions, whatever he has to say. Um, so, I mean, you know, a, as you said, Protopope of Akum is a major figure in the old believer movement for all of these reasons and was seen to some degree as a leader and figurehead of the movement. Um, we know that he was connected with um, Boyarina Morozhova um, and others who were came to be venerated as martyrs in the movement. And in his autobiography, gives accounts of the sufferings that they went through. One of the things that is interesting is he does account or relate the account in his autobiography that he was given multiple opportunities to accept the reforms and be restored to his position. Um, he may have even in one of those cases, I, I, I may be remembering this wrong, but it seems like he was offered the opportunity before the old books were anathematized to continue to serve according to the old books if he would just accept the new ones. 
And he says in his autobiography that he was prepared to accept the terms, that it was his wife who convinced him that he must stay the course and be a confessor for the old faith. Um, so, you know, we, we know that he and Patriarch Nikon were members of the same group early on and were, as you said, friends. And so that's where we see the vitriol come from. And ultimately, the reason that he was executed by the state was not because of the doctrinal issues, but that he was convicted of blasphemy, if I remember correctly, for insulting the czar and the patriarch. Um, and so was burned at the stake, um, though now there stands a memorial at that site um, commemorating his execution or his martyrdom, depending on how you look at it. And one of the things that we're seeing this year in light of this being the 400th anniversary of his birth is that he has very much become a symbol of Russianness to a certain degree. And there has been a little bit of a rehabilitation of him, even in the eyes of the church, even if they're not, you know, about to glorify him as a saint. Um, they've at least backed off to some degree on the condemnation of him. But in speaking about him, one of the things that we have to be careful of is you spoke, for example, about the fact that even among the old believers, he's not considered a saint for his writings, but because of his suffering, his death, his confession of Christ in the old rite. And some of his writings, beyond just using vulgar language or condemning the patriarch, are very problematic, especially for those in what we would refer to as the canonical church, because one of the things he writes is that true believers should trample on the mysteries of the Nikonians. And so we have to recognize there that what he's saying is that old believers should trample on what we understand to be the body and blood of Christ. And that puts a very problematic point of how we should approach him. Now, at the same time, you know, we recognize that even among the saints that there are disagreements among saints. Um, you have one from Alexandria, I can't remember who it was, who, you know, says in one of his letters that he would never commemorate St. John Chrysostom at the diptychs because of the rivalry between Alexandria and Constantinople. And yet these two are saintly figures in the church. So his words about Patriarch Nikon the Tsar, even if we were to consider all three of these figures to be holy, the question of what he says about the mysteries and how they should be treated is where we kind of get into a harder territory with how we should approach him. And I say that as someone who, you know, definitely respects him for the stance he took vis-a-vis -vis the old books, but 
this is something that we do have to wrestle with. Yes, it definitely is. And I think it's, 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 it's a problem that's, that one who reads about him and reads his writing stumbles upon very early. And it's, it's hard to somehow, um, I don't know, it's, it's hard to somehow accept some of his views yeah, I would even I would even go further and say that you know when the way he opposed the reforms and how he addressed the patriarch. I mean, there's even reports that he spit on him or in front of him. You know, I'm I'm not gonna quote one because I'm not sure which one it was, but he he didn't somehow, and you know I want to be careful not to offend anyone, but he didn't take the suffering like Christ took the suffering. You know, uh, I think and, and I think that we can see throughout old, believer, old believers and, and just their actions that they very much adopted his way of, of rejecting the so-called Nikonians, which was often in their polemics very aggressive, you know, you know, words like dogs, like servants of Satan, like Antichrist, you know, these are very common words that old believers use about, about the so-called Nikonians up to this day, you know. And I think it is somehow grounded in the fact that he did that already back then. You know. Well, but at the same time, we have to admit that if you read some of the church fathers writing against heretics, they will use similar language. Yeah. And so there, there is a tradition of that. I mean, like if you read, for example, um, St. Basil against Eunomius. Um, you know, they did not shy away from using personal invectives against their opponents. And so I think you could, to a certain degree, make the argument that in referring to his opponents, he was still within an established kind of tradition there. I think the difference uh, from, from my perspective as, as someone who is in communion with the church is that St. Basil the Great was right. Well, a vacuum, um, we could question some of the things he stood for, right? From our perspective, I'm not saying he was completely wrong or that we should completely reject everything he said. But, you know, his claim that only the Russians had the correct correct faith or practices for that matter. I mean, it's wrong. And I think that's where you get into this whole issue. And even the old believers will admit that his writings, I mean, he wrote something about Holy Communion where you should commune and then you should take it back home. Have you read that? He, he I have wrote, not. Yeah, he wrote, he wrote some teaching that when you commune as a priest, you should commune, then you should save a little bit, take it home and then take it uh, the next day at home. And it's like, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, um, there's some strange things. And I mean, you know, most people who read him admit that. So, so, uh, but you're definitely right. I mean, you know, polemics are usually very harsh. I just think that from our perspective, it becomes like, you know, he, as we don't agree with him or I don't at least fully, I think that's where the, the problems arise, but you're completely right. And, and I think we have to think about that. Um, well, and I mean, I would definitely agree with you there, you know, as someone in a church that, celebrates according to the new right you know i i obviously don't agree with everything he said about the reforms etc but at the same time we have to be careful in saying that his writings were bad because they had this harsh language because that's not necessarily what makes them a negative. What makes it negative is the places where we would say he's wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. I understand what, what you're saying, and, and you're right. I, I was more thinking of, you know, I was more connecting it to to his death, right? That he died, mm -hmm. died a martyr, and even though he was martyred, he was still referring to them like that. I was more thinking, you know, comparing to Christ and other martyrs who died, who died praying or who died, you know. Um, uh, I'm not saying he didn't pray when he died, but you know what I mean? I mean, I, I was looking at it from the perspective that he died for the faith. I wasn't thinking, yeah, but you're completely right. And, and, and it's interesting you bring up the celebrations in Russia this year, which sadly have been, most of them have been postponed because of, of you know what, the, the, the famous COVID. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting how you're saying, you know, you're right that he has been rehabilitated in one way. 
and especially so as a writer, I think that uh, his writings are, are very important for Russian history. Uh, but he has also become a symbol for for some sort of um, you know rejection of modernity you know a sort of return to the roots uh, and by roots the old believers being before 1650 not you know if you go to a rock or church the most traditional thing in the world is you know Tsar Nicholas II and, and the liturgy in 1915 right but when when these people the old ritualists speak about tradition it's it's five four four five hundred years at least and he has become a symbol of that. And we have to acknowledge that he did in his own mind probably die for that faith and for those practices. Whether he, he actually died for it or not, that's up to God. I, you know, I'm not going to dare to judge why exactly he died. Uh, but in his own mind, I'm sure that he defended the practices of Saint Sergei of Radonish. You know, this is what he defended uh, in his own mind. So, so. So you know, it's it's he he's very symbolic for the old believers, and he's a very central central figure in their um, in their understanding of the world, and somehow in their view, or at least traditionally speaking, because uh, you even have liberals among all believers these days. But traditionally speaking, he 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 represents what they should be like, you know, and that they should pay the ultimate price. And I mean, you know, there's stories about old believer communities, you know, burning themselves alive. In the, in the 17th century just to resist the Nikonians, you know, and somehow I, I do have to think that's connected to that ideology and, and that, that way, that, that outlook on the world, you know, mm. and now you're sitting like a real old believer with your hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's a little cold here, so trying to yeah, keep yeah, you're, some of you're the in Pennsylvania, yeah, I heard you have snow. We do. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, nice amounts of it in a few places so yeah so, so you know i i feel that that anyone who who hasn't read his book you know i think it's it's fine to read it i think it's it's uh, as long as we read it in a right context you know it's very much bound to what he went through and when he went through that and and if you're okay with some swear words and some some bad language i think it's it's, it's worth it's worth reading um and, and, and knowing, knowing, you know, his position. I mean, definitely for anyone who has an interest in old belief in the old right of the church, I think to a large degree you can't understand really any of the modern situation without understanding Archpriest of Akum. I mean, you know, even if you get into the Orthodox old ritualist of the Yudhina Verzi and studying someone like St. Simon of Okta, well, you know, his, his bishop early on in his priesthood, who was a bishop of the state church and thus a Nikonian referred to him as the second Avahum. And so really even, you know, if you're looking at those who are within the canonical church, you can't fully understand that history without understanding Urge Priest Avahum. So yeah, I definitely think that anyone who is interested in the old right should read about him and read his own words and you know it, it's available in english yeah, so and another thing just before we end i wanted to bring up really quickly really quickly is that if we look at avacum and, and nikon and, and all those events we can see how important practices were to people 400 years ago to simple people you know avacum wasn't very educated he was from a priestly family and he became a priest naturally and, and to them do, uh, uh, rituals became dogma uh, and 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 they i think there's a risk with that and i think that these reforms show this risk on both sides you know because it, it they're I, I, you know i would say they're both equally guilty of the same um exaggeration of of, of, of rituals being one and the same as dogma you know and I think for anyone uh, wanting to look at that and seeing see that, I think this time period in Russia is very interesting and very important. 
uh, rituals are very important. They are essential. They are crucial. You would say, but but they're not completely the same, one and the same as the dogma. And I think the, the, the sad reforms just showed to us how both sides exaggerated. I think. Absolutely, because I mean, you have early on, the Patriarch of Constantinople wrote to Patriarch Nikon about the reforms or before the reforms about the differences between Constantinopolitan ritual and Russian ritual and said that, you know, the ritual didn't matter as long as the faith expressed was the same. But for Patriarch Nikon, the the idea was that, well, if the faith's the same, then the ritual has to be the same because ritual is dogma. Yeah. And so... It, it was just the Russian mindset of the time rather than something that was specific to the old believers or to the reformers. Yeah, I completely, completely agree. And it's a, it's a lesson we all must learn and, and something we should all draw, should draw, I mean, draw from and, and in ourselves understand that what really matters and, and what can somehow be secondary yet still very important. So I personally feel feel happy with what we have said here today. I don't know if you have something else that you would like to add. I I, I don't. Um, well, I mean, I guess the one thing may be that, you know, in considering how do we properly look at the relationship between dogma and ritual, I would go to a quote from St. Simon of Okta, who I mentioned earlier, um, who said that ritual is the clothing of dogma. And so, you know, it's, it's what adorns dogma. It's as close to dogma as you can get without being dogma. But it's not dogma in the end. Very poetic. He he almost sounds like like Saint Ephraim the Syrian, who speaks a lot about symbolism and uses clothes as uh, as a symbol for faith and 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 revelation. So maybe he read Saint Ephraim because I think he was quite popular in the nineteenth century in Russia. I mean, Bishop Saint Theophan the Reckless read him as well. So maybe maybe there's something there. Yeah, and I would completely agree with Saint Simon, and and I think that. Uh, this is a good lesson for us to to remember and and cherish that dog uh, uh, rituals are very important but but they're not dogma they're almost dogma i would say right so so okay so, uh, it's not simon <laughs> it's not simon you're they justin <laughs> thank you justin for for joining uh, joining me and hopefully we will be able to do this more often we had i think four months break well, you know, um, I, I, and I one of the things that I say is, you know, I had said a couple of months ago that we would ho hopefully have a special episode that ended up not happening because you visited us here in the U.S. and we were finally able to share the same space and had hoped to record an episode while you were here, but we didn't get to, but it was nice to finally meet you in person. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same. It was nice. It was sad we couldn't do it, but it was. We had so little time, even just to see each other, uh, right. so that you know we, we we could have recorded it over a beer, but that wouldn't be fitting. So we choose just <laughs> to have beer. So we just choose to have a beer instead, right? Exactly. <laughs> so. Sure. So, but hopefully, you know, God willing, uh, there'll be more trips uh, and maybe we'll do one in real life soon. Who knows? God willing. So. Yes, God willing. So again, uh, Simon, Justin, thank you. And thank you. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and watching and listening. Hopefully it, will, it was helpful. And if you have any questions or even objections, or if you want to scorn us, you can, you, you can do that in the in the comment section and and you know you can always like this and you can uh, let us know 
that you like and by liking it and following us and whatever. I'm trying to be a YouTube guy now. I have no idea what I'm talking about. So just do whatever you want. Like, subscribe and hit the notification yeah. button. Yes. Oh. Wow. He knows. He knows for real. It must be. I, I, I've watched too many reactors. So, you know. Probably, probably. So hopefully we'll be back soon with a new, new episode in the Old Believer series. Until then, stay safe. God bless you all. And, and see you soon. See you soon.